Modern historians tend to attribute all the blame for the Nazi nightmare in the Second World War to a single person, Hitler. People are told that Hitler trampled on the Constitution and destroyed democracy, tore the Peace Treaty of Versailles to shreds, created the all-destroying Wehrmacht from scratch, and sent millions of unquestionably obeying soldiers to their deaths, not only without anyone's help, but also against the resistance of a legion of enemies from the camp of the capitalists. In other words, that it was him, and only him, who was the driving force of events, and no one was behind him, that there were no businessmen who made money from the war, and that there were no war criminals at the highest positions. They rant about the racism of just one Hitler, about the party of just one Hitler, about the terror of just one Hitler, about the robbery of just one Hitler, and about the war of just one Hitler. They depict the elimination of unemployment, construction of roads and clean streets, the handiwork of the alleged mystery man, who was a vegetarian and yet monstrously cruel, who more than anything loved pets, but also ordered millions of people to be gassed. Such pseudoscientific research about the soul of the Nazi leader pursues one goal, to transfer problems from the social plane to the psychological plane, in order to then rehabilitate the socio-economic system that gave rise to all the horrors of fascism. The real reason that the thesis of Hitler's soul guilt is particularly beloved by modern thinkers is largely because of its exceptional suitability for conservative propaganda. The disused Nazi legend of the all-powerful miracle worker, the savior of the nation, is simply turned inside out and turns into an anti-legend about an all-powerful villain and then fastened to pseudo-historical views about the omnipotence of a unique person. Because of this, this thesis perfectly meshes with the social order of modern conservative historiography, which seeks to justify the imperialist system of capitalism, undermined by inhumanity and war, and to contribute to its preservation and consolidation. After all, if we accept as correct the statement that Hitler was the sole creator and executor of the sinister plans of German fascism and the sole culprit of the Second World War, so it logically follows that it's absolutely useless to look for other perpetrators of crimes in the 1930s or 40s or to ask a question about the social causes of the course of development in Germany. But if the task of removing blame from individuals was at the forefront for the Nazi advocates in Nuremberg, then historians hostile to progress began to defend an entire class in order to rehabilitate the social order represented by this class. The main attention of conscientious researchers of fascism should be directed to the study of its socio-economic causes, in other words, the conditions that made it possible to promote fascism. Communists do not deny the role of personality in history, but they also take into account that the real question that arises when evaluating the social activity of an individual is, under what conditions is this activity guaranteed success? What are the guarantees that this activity will not remain a single act, drowning in a sea of opposite acts? Decisive factor here is demand for such activity meaning demand for personal qualities and abilities which meet demand for such activity. If the decisive factor is demand, that would only mean substitutability of any individual, the ability of personality to influence history, determined by the organization of society, the ratio of its forces. The character of the individual is a factor of social development, only where, only if, and only insofar as social relations allow it.
The pipe is quite versatile. Solid, liquid, and gaseous substances can be transported through the pipe. Pipes are used in the construction of buildings and structures, in plumbing. They make protective covers or just artistic decor. They even play them. They also make weapons out of pipes. Pistols, semi-automatic guns, mortars, anti-aircraft guns, tanks, missiles, ship guns, and so on. The Krupp Empire was founded in 1811 in the city of Essen. This is in the Ruhr region in western Germany. And of course, they were engaged in pipes. The Krupp dynasty is a well-known manufacturer of weapons and military products. Krupp received its first contract with the government in 1844, when the Prussian military ordered an experimental Castile cannon. By the 1860s, Krupp became a major supplier of the cannons, not only to his homeland, but also to Russia, Austria, Belgium, Holland, Spain, England, and so on. After the win in the Franco-Prussian War in 1871, Alfred Krupp, head of the firm, got his nickname, the Cannon King. Krupp's steel cannons, which were breech loaders, meaning loaded from the rear, showed their huge advantage over the old bronze muzzle loading cannons. After the proclamation of the German Empire, the country began a rapid period of industrial growth. It is clear that the Krupp interests were never limited only to military products. They were into railways, locomotives, steel making, coal mining, and other commodities, like shipbuilding and so on. In general, steel, coal, iron, and everything related. The rapid concentration of production and capital was noted by Friedrich Engels in his work, The Socialism of Mr. Bismarck. Take a steel, for example. A period of speculation and feverish production rewarded Germany with two enterprises, the Dortmund Association and the La Rachute, each of which could individually produce as much as is necessary on average for the entire consumption of the country. Then there is the giant Krupp enterprise in Essen, another similar one in Bochum, and an infinite number of smaller ones. So the consumption of iron inside the country is covered in at least three or four times. One might say that such a situation imperatively requires the most unlimited freedom of trade, which alone can ensure the sale of this huge surplus of products. This could be said, but it is not the opinion of interested parties, since there are only a dozen businesses to be reckoned with, and that dominate the others, what the Americans call a ring is for, an association to maintain prices within the country and to regulate exports. Krupp for a long period of time has enjoyed a special position in Germany, receiving exceptional support from the government. Among the Krupp patrons were the highest officials of the German Empire, ardent militarists and imperialists, Kaiser Wilhelm I, his grandson Wilhelm II, as well as the notorious Reich Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. The Krupps wanted to make cannons, and the monarchs wanted to buy them. It was a marriage of convenience, and even death could not break it. The union of the Krupp dynasty and the royal family Hohenzollern was literally inherited. The Krupp company is the largest supplier of weapons for the Kaiser's Germany's army and navy, continue to expand production, and if during the Franco-Prussian War the total value of its products was 29 million marks, then towards the end of the century this figure almost doubled up to 56 million marks. At the same time, more than 80% of all military products, as well as half of the civilian ones, were exported. The Cannon King vigorously fought for foreign markets for his guns, railway equipment, and steel products. Krupp resorted to various means to take over markets, for example, traditional dumping. They are going to build a railway bridge in Scotland, over the sea arm near Edinburgh. The bridge needs 10,000 tons of Bessemer steel, who agrees to the lowest price, who beats all their competitors in all this, in the home of the large iron industry in England. A German patronized by Bismarck in many ways, Herr Krupp of Essen, the Cannon King. Also, the Krupps did not forget to strengthen the conservative foundations of the German Empire. Alfred Krupp hated social democracy, fearing the creation of labor unions in his enterprises, along with approving government measures against the social democrats, he introduced the so-called general rules, which provided for unquestioning obedience to the requirements of the firm. 
At the same time, the company provided workers with apartments, pensions, built hospitals and libraries, schools, and homes for the disabled. Krupp's salary was slightly higher than in a number of other businesses. All this called the carrot and the stick policy. When monopoly super profits disappear, so does the carrot, but not the stick. Wage slavery can exist even without poverty and violence. An indentured slave may be well-fed, well-dressed, and well-housed, but they are still an indentured slave. After all, their survival depends entirely on the master-owner. There is no humane wage slavery. This is why the ideas of an organized and independent labor movement permeate businesses no matter what. The Krupp firm was no exception. For example, a strike at a shipyard, Germania, in 1907. In addition to their activities against the workers' movement, the Krupps carried out a broad campaign in the press in the interests of militarism and the arms race. A striking example of this policy was the creation, with the participation of Krupp, of the German Navy League in 1898. The League was engaged in lobbying, if you can say that, of the collective interests of shipbuilders. How is that done? For example, they buy newspapers, put the right people in the editorial office who write the correct material about the evil English, the French, doesn't matter who, simply to intimidate the public. All of this is sure to be diluted with chatter about how well to spend taxes on orders from private owners and not on social needs. Thus the imperial ambitions of politicians come to mutual agreement and understanding with the greed of the capitalists. A year later, Wilhelm II loudly declared, Our future is on the water. The job is done, the contracts were provided, investment in propaganda had paid off. As a result of its activities, the Krupps controlled a number of major newspapers and publishers. After all, what is the freedom of the press in an entrepreneurial way? The freedom to incite chauvinistic hatred and shape public opinion in the interests of the owner including, if necessary, unleashing a world war. The relationship between the press and one of the directors of the Krupp Corporation, Alfred Hugenberg, was very close. The media magnate who helped the rise of the Nazi party in the late 1920s. He is also one of the founders of the ultra-conservative organization, the Pan-German League. Hugenberg left Krupp's firm after the defeat in World War I to found the German National People's Party. This party, by the way, will be the closest competitor of the Nazis in the struggle for power. We also should not ignore the issue of merging between the industry, banks, and the government. It was done by including representatives of these circles in the supervisory board and other governing bodies of Krupp. For example, the same Hugenberg, before working for Krupp, was a Kaiser official in the Prussian Ministry of Finance and the Prussian Minister of Railways. Dielen was a member of the supervisory board while the brother of Reich Chancellor von Bülow also held a prominent position in the firm. Governing bodies of the corporation also included representatives of such major banks as Disconto Gesellschaft and Dresdner Bank. On the other hand, the supervisory boards of the same banks also had seats for Krupp's directors. The process of strengthening of such Krupp's connections was emphasized by Vladimir Lenin in his book, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Transactions between particularly big firms assume a form which, as Schilder mildly puts it, borders on corruption. Krupp in Germany, Schneider in France, Armstrong in Britain are instances of firms which have close connections with powerful banks and governments, and which cannot easily be ignored when a loan is being arranged. In any case, Krupp's dividends were getting higher and higher every year. Right before World War I beginning, the Krupp family took sixth place on the list of the richest people in the German Empire. There can be no doubt that France, Great Britain, Germany, and Russia sought the war. But it's not our job to task all participants in the conflict. It's enough to remember that the processes of monopolization of the market, merging of business and the state, inciting chauvinistic hysteria and imperialism, were common to all parties, not without their own national specifics, of course. However, 
In order to hide the purely material interest underlying the policy of German imperialism, entrepreneurs and nobles portrayed this policy as protecting the national interests of the country. This was the only way to gain public support. This is the only way to send millions of people to the slaughter. An important brainwashing organization was the Pan-German League. Its foundation in the year 1890 was no accident. On the contrary, it was a logical addition to the economic phenomena of the time. The task of the Pan-German League was to prepare correct public opinion in parties and organizations, among teachers of secondary and higher educational institutions, and in the press. Before the First World War, the Pan-German League consisted of about 20,000 people. Among them were industrialists, wealthy speculators, and intellectuals. But the board consisted almost exclusively of nobles, large industrialists, and generals. For example, one of the founders of the League was steel magnate Emil Kierdorf, an extremely conservative personality, hater of labor unions and any concessions to workers, a future sponsor of the NSDAP, as well as a close friend and associate of Hitler. Heinrich Klass, chairman of the Pan-German League, an anti-Semite nicknamed Rabid Racialist, he writes in his memoirs, Kirdorf was one of the first to inform me of the doubts raised by German social policy. With passionate determination, he said that insurance for the elderly reduces workers' sense of responsibility. He has already seen the entire nation turn into pensioners living on social security. In addition to Kierdorf, the Pan-German League consisted of Hugo Stins, representative of the Rheinisch Westfalian Coal Syndicate. Kierdorf, by the way, was from the same place. Stins' cousin, Karl Insenplitz, a ship owner. Of course, Alfred Hugenberg, Krupp's man and one of the founders of the Pan-German League. And Lieutenant General August Keim, manager of the German Navy League that we talked about earlier. This is also a Krupp man. Keim contributed to fomenting chauvinist hysteria around France, Russia, and Great Britain in order to build up the Navy. Of course you can't get around the officials from the memoirs of the same class. He, Klaas, talking about Foreign Secretary von Kinderlen Wächter, by his own initiative, expressed his readiness to provide me with the amount I consider necessary from the secret fund of the Foreign Office, the Secretary himself has again expressed his readiness to assist me in all cases where it is possible for him to do so. Naturally, all talk about races, living space, the greatness of the nation, and so on. All this is an empty husk hiding in the real interests of clear profit. Who will develop the captured raw material deposits? Private owners. Who will sell their products in new markets? Private owners. Where is the truly German, French, English, Russian land? Of course, where there are factories, raw materials, and trade routes. No nation claims the desert until oil is found there. Coincidence? Of course not. See for yourself. The war had begun, so now it was necessary to bring the individual military goals of individual stakeholders to a common denominator. War is a collective event, so the goal should be collective, not individual. With this agenda, Alfred Hugenberg in August 1914 visited the chairman of the Pan-German League, Heinrich Klaas, and gave him the directives of the Ruhr magnates. Klaas skillfully formulated a program of military goals. On August 28, it was approved by the board of the Pan-German League. The carefully crafted document was sent to 2,000 prominent industrialists, bankers, nobles, and senior military officials. Of course, negotiations dragged on, but at the end of January 1915, everything was settled. The project of collective military goals was developed. In March of the same year, a representative of the business unions addressed to the Reichstag. Along with the demand for a colonial empire, business unions see the main goal of the struggle imposed on us in ensuring and improving the European basis for the existence of the German Empire in the following areas. In order to ensure our prestige at sea, Belgium must be subject to German imperial law and military, customs policy, as well as money circulation, banking and postal affairs. Railways and waterways should be included in our transportation system. And so on and so forth. To France, they put forward a demand for the transfer of the northern industrial region in Lorraine. 
and in the interests of the nobles, demands were made for the annexation of Poland, the Baltic states, and Ukraine. At the same time, the leaders of the Pan-German League took on intellectuals and created a memorandum where 1,200 of the most prominent representatives of science and art signed up for the above-mentioned military goals and declared the need to protect the culture of Germany and Europe against the invasion of barbarians of the East and against the vengeance and lust for domination of the West. As we can see, Dr. Goebbels did not invent anything fundamentally new. As for the fate of the Crook Company, as befits all gunsmiths, they warmly welcomed what was happening. And why wouldn't they? Right before the beginning of the war, its enterprises employed just over 80,000 people. This figure immediately rose up to 118,000, and then 150,000. In the first year of the war alone, 35 large factories were built in Essen by itself. In the first year of the war, Essen supplied the army with over 900 cannons and 300 light howitzers. In the second year, ammunition factories produced almost 8 million shells. And in the third year, Krupp achieved quite staggering results. Every month, 9 million shells and 3,000 cannons came off the assembly lines. Most of the naval guns, ship armor, and submarine fleet also the merit of the Krupp company. However, during the war, German capital faced an acute shortage of workers. This, of course, is not surprising. The front takes the most able-bodied. In this regard, at the end of 1916, Germany introduced labor service for all men aged 17 to 60 years. In parallel with the development of the law and labor service in the autumn of 1916, the German military governor of Brussels received an order obliging Belgian citizens to work in rural enterprises. The forced labor of the Belgians was largely the merit of Krupp. In September of 1916, the chief of staff of the German Empire, General Ludendorff, met with Gustav Krupp and Karl Duisberg of IG Farben. Ludendorff wrote the following about this meeting. I discussed this matter, war production, with Herr Duisberg and Herr Krupp von Bohlen and Halbach. They considered it quite possible, in view of our stocks of raw material, to increase our output of war material if only the labor problem could be solved. And the problem of labor shortage was indeed solved. Over 100,000 Belgians were taken into slavery. The huge role of the Krupp company during those years was noted even at the Nuremberg trials. During the First World War, the Krupp firm, needless to say, was Germany's principal arsenal. Guns, shells, and armor plates poured out of the Krupp factories. Warships and submarines were built, armed and fitted at the Germania shipyards. Together with the other leading steel plants, Krupp supplied the finished and semi-finished steel for building, transport, and a variety of other industrial uses. As for the profit of the corporation during the war, according to this book, it amounted to about 800 million marks. For some, it's war, and for another, mother. Lenin wrote these words at the end of 1917, a year before the end of the First World War. Capitalism can't grow continuously. Wars, crises, and unemployment are products of capitalism itself. Let's turn to the Nuremberg trials and see how true Lenin's words are. The Nuremberg Military Tribunal, the Krupp case, open page 61, count 1, planning, preparation, initiation, and execution of aggressive wars. Let's move on to point B, the Versailles Treaty. The armistice which ended the First World War did not, surprisingly enough, end Krupp's armament activities completely. Krupp continued to repair and recondition certain guns and to complete the manufacture of new guns which were almost ready at the end of the war. In fact, Germany's defeat in the First World War in and of itself would probably not have radically affected Krupp's armament activities but the disarmament provisions of the Treaty of Versailles were quite another matter. These provisions confronted the Krupp managers with a major question of policy, whether to convert the Krupp enterprises into a steel combine, similar to those in Germany and other countries, with its principal foundations in a peacetime economy, 
or whether to make special efforts to preserve Krupp's preeminent position in the armament field. In a report for 1937-1938, the Directorium of Krupp outlined what decision was made then, immediately after the First World War. In spite of numerous doubts, and contrary to the advice of outside experts, it decided to safeguard the valuable experiences irreplaceable for the armed strength of our nation and to keep up the shops and personnel in readiness if the occasion should arise for armament orders later on. With this view in mind, we chose objects for the new program of manufacture on which the personnel could obtain and improve their experience in the processing and refining of material, even though the manufacture and sale of these products partly entailed big losses. The same report goes on to say, When, in 1933, we were again called upon to manufacture war material in large quantities, we were immediately ready to do so. The head of the company, Gustav Krupp, held a similar position in those years. He writes in 1941, If Germany should ever be reborn, if it should shake off the chains of Versailles one day, the Krupp concern had to be prepared again. I wanted and had to maintain Krupp, in spite of all opposition, as an armament plan, although for the distant future. However, the prosecution emphasizes that Krupp made its decision not only for patriotic reasons, but also in the expectation that the future buyer will reimburse all losses incurred. In his address to the high command of the German armed forces in 1940, Krupp firm writes, the following details are to provide the justification for the increase in sales prices which the firm Krupp needs for its manufacture. Without government orders, and merely out of the conviction that one day Germany must again fight to rise, the Krupp firm has, from the years 1918 to 1933, maintained employees and workshops, and preserved their experience in the manufacture of war materials at their own cost. Only this procedure made it possible at the beginning of the rearmament period to produce straightaway heavy artillery, armor plates, tanks, and such like in large quantities. Finally, it must not be thought the Krupp stood alone or unsupported in the decision taken by his firm. As we will see, the chiefs of the German army and navy played exactly the same game and worked very closely with Krupp. So did various leading political figures of the Weimar Republic. Joseph Wirth, Chancellor of the German Republic in 1921 and 1922, wrote a letter to Gustav Krupp in 1940 in which the following appears. I recall with satisfaction the years of 1920 till 1923 when together with Mr. Director Dr. Wittfeldt, both of us were able to lay new foundations for the development of the German armament technique through your great and most significant firm. Mr. Reich President von Hindenburg, as is well known, had been informed of it. His reaction also was very creditable. Your most respected firm was assured of 10 years service for the government on account of my initiative as the Reich Chancellor and Reich Minister of Finance by releasing considerable means of the Reich for the preservation of German armament technique. A true example of entrepreneurial hypocrisy. In 1940, they whined that they did everything at their own expense, and then it turns out that, no, not everything. It turns out that there were secret government subsidies. It turns out that the Krupp firm survived not only on its own money, but also on taxpayers' money. In any case, there was not a single day when Germany accepted defeat in the war. The violation of the Treaty of Versailles and the rearmament program were supported in all influential circles of the country. Politicians, military, entrepreneurs. In 1926, German Minister of Foreign Affairs Gustav Stresemann received the Nobel Peace Prize, while the country's industry was slowly preparing for a new war. What was this preparation? Let's look further. In 1942, Gustav Krupp wrote, Without arousing any commotion, the necessary measures and preparations were undertaken. Thus, to the surprise of many people, Krupp began to manufacture products which were really appeared to be far distant from the previous work of an armament plant. Even the Allied snooping commissions were duped padlocks, milk cans, cash registers, track repair machines, trash carts, and similar small junk appeared really unsuspicious 
and even locomotives and automobiles made an entirely civilian impression. What kind of production did German entrepreneurs manage to hide? Number 1. Submarines In 1937, the German Navy compiled a secret document entitled The Fight of the Navy Against Versailles. It appears from this document that in 1920, Krupp's Germania Shipbuilding Company, with the approval of the German Admiralty, sold its blueprints of projected German submarine types to Japan, and that Japan adopted these blueprints as the basis for the construction of its own submarine cruisers. The construction of submarines in accordance with these blueprints at the Kawasaki Shipbuilding Company was carried out under the supervision of German submarine constructors and under the personal direction of the chief submarine constructor of the Germania shipyards, Dr. Techel, a German naval officer with extensive experience in submarine warfare, participated in the trial runs of these submarines and, of course, reported his observations to the German Admiralty. A much more important step was the establishment in 1922 of a dummy Dutch company called the Engineer Office for Shipbuilding, commonly abbreviated IVS. This company was established in Holland with the approval of Admiral Benke of the German Admiralty and that the purpose of the IVS from the standpoint of the Admiralty was to keep together an efficient German submarine office and, by practical work for foreign navies, to keep it in continuous practice and on top of technical developments. All this, as it is written in a secret military report, it was possible to put the first submarine into service only three months after the restoration of military sovereignty declared on the 16th of March, 1935. Number 2. Artillery and Tanks Gustav Krupp was not the only man who decided to undermine the Treaty of Versailles and prepare for a resurgence of German armed might. There was another man, not so well known to the world at large, General Oberst Hans von Siecht, chief of the German Army Command from 1921 to 1926. Late in November 1925, His Excellency General von Siecht paid a five-day visit to the Ruhr primarily to confirm with Gustav Krupp von Berlin and to inspect the Krupp plants. General von Siecht noted the readiness of Krupp to oblige the military administration in order to gain experience in designing armaments. Just as in the case of submarines, Krupp's first move was to secure foreign bases for experimentation. This time the country chosen was Sweden, the firm Bofors. Bofors took over several Krupp contracts for the delivery of guns to Holland and Denmark the fulfillment of which in Germany was prohibited by the Versailles Treaty. The experience in the design and testing of these guns was made available in turn by Krupp to the Reich Ministry of Defense. Guns, however, can be designed and tested more secretly than submarines, and in the field of artillery, violations of the treaty took place within Germany as well as abroad. Krupp activities within Germany were based upon a secret agreement on the 25th of January 1922, with the Reich Defense Ministry. Here, again, the story is told clearly and succinctly by the secret Krupp artillery history. These agreements of the 25th of January 1922 stressed that as a matter of mutual interest, it was imperative to draw on Krupp's experience for the continued development of guns of a caliber of 17 centimeters and below of munitions and vehicles, as well as also to make available to Krupp the experiences derived by the Reich Defense Ministry in this field. On the 1st of July 1925, Krupp and the German Army's Inspection Office for Arms and Equipment established an artillery designing office in Berlin under the camouflage of the name Koch and Kinsle. The Krupp secret history lists a half dozen or more important artillery design projects. Many of these tasks related to the design of specific types of guns, such as light and medium self-propelled guns and tank guns. The departure of the Inter-Allied Control Commission also signaled the revival of Krupp work in connection with the design of tanks. In the early correspondence on this subject between Krupp and the Reich Defense Ministry, the tanks were referred to as tractors. Besides tanks, other types of military vehicles and self-propelled gun carriages were also developed. Fun fact that later tractors get characterized to light, medium, and heavy. One interesting letter, 
written in November 1927 from the Ministry of Defense to the Krupp firm, set forth the specifications for an artillery power tractor, which according to the specifications, was to be of such a size as to enable the tractor to be shipped on an ordinary open railroad car, considering the smallest Belgian and French loading capacity. In conclusion, the prosecutor says, Krupp deliberately decided, in conspiracy with the German military and political leaders, to violate the treaty in every possible way, and to lay the groundwork for the rearmament of Germany. But these events have a much deeper significance for this case. One can for convenience divide recent German history into the period of the Weimar Republic and of the Third Reich, but there was no impermeable barrier between the two. The one flows into the other, and Hitler's dictatorship was conditioned by the history of the preceding republic. The Weimar Republic and the Third Reich had many common denominators, and one of them was the Krupp firm. What the Krupp firm accomplished under the Republic was a vitally important part of the process of German rearmament for aggressive war. What in the end? The prosecution was more familiar with the dialectic of historical development than many modern historians. One is connected to another, one follows another. Nothing comes out of nowhere. The Third Reich is the result of the development of the Weimar Republic. They are inseparable. As the prosecution rightly pointed out, Krupp was just one of the common denominators. In the Farben case, you can find another one. However, the list of common denominators is not limited to these two companies. Before moving on to the development of relations between Krupp and the Nazis, we need to go back to the end of the First World War. It is time to talk about the role of the heavy industry in general. Usually the word Ruhr implies the Ruhr region, which is in western Germany. The largest coal deposits in Europe are located there. In addition, many trade routes and interchanges pass through the Ruhr, and all this in a fairly compact location. Due to this combination of circumstances, the Ruhr became the industrial center of the country, coal, iron, steel, and derivatives. Although after the Second World War, a lot has changed there. For example, in 2018, the last coal mine in the Ruhr region was closed, and in general, Germany no longer produces its own coal. It is environmentally impractical, but we digressed. The defeat in the First World War dealt a serious blow to all the Ruhr magnates, and it's not even about the war itself. It's about the November Revolution of 1918. Workers literally forced entrepreneurs to introduce an eight-hour working day, recognize labor unions, collective agreements, social packages, and so on. The response was pretty rapid. The financing of private military armies, in other words the Freikorps and other ultra-right reactionary and conservative organizations and movements. The Nazis are a drop in the bucket. There were hundreds of similar organizations. Today we can distinguish two main lines of German imperialist policy and resistance to progress. The line of the coal iron steel group Dresdner Bank and the line of the electrical engineering chemistry group Deutsche Bank. Both of these lines are easily traced in the first post-revolutionary years. On the one hand, the whip, intimidation, violence, reprisals, and murders against workers and their leaders. This is the line of the Ruhr heavy industry and nobility businessmen. On the other hand, the carrot, flexible parliamentarianism, flirting with the working class, bribing trade union leaders, fooling the masses. This is the line of the large chemical and electrical interests. The economic roots of this division seem to have been the following. The First World War severely affected the state of mining and metal enterprises. Number one, machines and equipment were worn out by the war and needed to be updated. Number two, large losses of enterprises and commodity bases, which were incurred by coal, iron, steel businessmen as a result of the Treaty of Versailles. Number three, commercial interest in militarism and war since the production of weapons in those years was mainly in the hands of steel interests. Number four, unfavorable prospects for export of goods due to the development of world production in this area. All this created the need for and special interest in increasing working hours and eliminating the social gains of the workers. The heavy industry could not make concessions for commercial reasons, unlike its counterparts in the electrical and chemical industries. 
Those two industries were relatively recent and could compensate for some of their losses by increasing the intensity of labor and rationalizing it, changes which in older industries were already made. In addition, global production in these areas of industry was much less competitive, which preserved the export potential. However, the fact that individual groups of entrepreneurs and their representatives in politics were often at odds with each other, and that they could not pursue their policies in a straight line, makes it possible for pseudo-historians to draw the picture of the formation of Hitlerism as a struggle of countless groups and individuals who allegedly do not have a common class interest. When you look at the same Pan-German League and its chairman Klaas, as early as 1919, he emphasized that the entire future of German industry depends on the right relationship between workers and entrepreneurs. Take the country's main business union, the National Federation of German Industry, and its protests against the eight-hour working day and against limiting its duration in general. In 1924, these imprudent people wrote, the main evil of the past is an eight-hour working day. The struggle of the employers' unions was directed solely against it from the very beginning. In essence, all rhetoric of German business during the Weimar Republic can be reduced to this need to extend the working day, reduce wages, and reduce the social package. Ring any bells? These are the common class interests. No entrepreneur's union has ever advocated for reduction of the working day while maintaining the salary for all workers in the country. Or take the investigative bodies at the Nuremberg trial, which emphasize the crucial role of German capitalists in the formation of the Third Reich, whose social policy we will discuss later. For example, the Farben case. The main common aim of both groups was aggrandizement at the expense of other countries and the reaping of the spoils thereof, regardless of whether war might be necessary to accomplish this purpose, and regardless of how much death, misery, and destruction might ensue. This common objective bound the two groups together, and without this collaboration, Hitler and his party followers would never have been able to seize and consolidate their power in Germany, and the Third Reich would never have dared to plunge the world into war. The Flick case. We do not seek to incriminate the entire population, but it is a gross misconception to picture the Third Reich as the tyranny of Hitler and his close party henchmen alone. A dictatorship is successful not because everybody opposes it, but because powerful groups support it. The Nazi dictatorship was no exception to this principle. In fact, it was not a dictatorship of the Nazis alone, and while at least one of the men in the dock is an ardent Nazi, this circumstance is coincident rather than significant. Hitler was, to be sure, the focus of ultimate authority, but Hitler derived his power from the support of other influential men and groups who agreed with his basic ideas and objectives. The defendants in this case are leading representatives of one of the two principal concentrations of power in Germany. In the final analysis, Germany's capacity for conquest derived from its heavy industry. Krupp, Flick, Thyssen, and a few others swayed the industrial group. Beck, Fritsch, Rundstedt, and other martial exemplars ruled the military clique. On the shoulders of these groups, Hitler rode to power, and from power to conquest. The Krupp case. The name, prestige, and financial support of Krupp was used to bring the NSDAP into power over Germany and to put into effect its announced program. Meanwhile, we must not forget that in the first years of its existence, the Nazis were just one of many. At that time, money was showered on any anti-labor and anti-communist movements. For example, with the support of the Ruhr industrialists, the nobility, a number of German banks, and the Pan-German League, the first attempt was made to abolish all social achievements of the workers, the Kupputsch. In response to the Berlin takeover on March 13, 1920, a general strike began, involving 12 million workers. The work of the enterprises all throughout Germany was paralyzed altogether. Not expecting such a rebuff, the organizers asked the Putschists to leave them and return all power to the Social Democrats. On March 17th, the rioters fled Berlin. On March 23rd, the strike ended. The peak of confrontation between the Putschists and workers fell on the Ruhr region. From March 10th to 21st, there were clashes between workers and cops formations. Spontaneously, groups of the Red Army were organized, which had up to 100,000 workers, mostly miners. The Ruhr Red Army drove rioter units out of the industrial area and occupied the cities. 
On March 19th, Red Army Worker Battalions occupied Essen, the capital of the Krupp Concern. On March 23rd and 24th, after the defeat of the COPS formations, a meeting was held between the government and workers' organizations. Officials promised to disarm and punish reactionary rioters, amnesty workers, combatants, and create a working self-defense to socialize the coal industry, etc. After that, workers returned to work and the Red Army withdrew from their positions. However, the government demanded the dissolution of the Red Army and the restoration of order. On April 2nd and 3rd, more than 100,000 units of the Reichswehr people entered the Ruhr with help of police detachments and Freikorps, and by using aircraft and armored vehicles, they suppressed the resistance of the poorly armed Red Army. Thousands of workers were shot or sentenced to long terms in prison. The second attempt to eliminate the achievements of the November Revolution by force was carried out by the Nazis, the Beer Hall Putsch of 1923. Moreover, both the Kopp Putsch and the Beer Hall Putsch are closely connected with one person, General Ludendorff. In both, he was one of the organizers. Moreover, it was this person who contributed to the enslavement of Belgians during the First World War. By the time of the Beer Hall Putsch, Ludendorff was already in the Nazi party, and naturally, the general had connections with heavy industry entrepreneurs. Let's turn to the memoirs of one of these entrepreneurs. Fritz Thyssen, the largest Ruhr industrialist in those years, like some Deripaska or Abramovich today, opening his book, I Paid Hitler. In October 1923, I made a trip to Munich. Just after the Ruhr incident, I was asked to become the head of a Reich government to replace the cabinet headed by Wilhelm Kuno, which was universally regarded as too weak. Dr. Klaas, the head of the Pan-German League, approached me on the subject. He asked me to take advantage of the prestige I had acquired by virtue of my activities during the Ruhr occupation and thus to revive successfully the national counter-revolution in which Kopp had failed in 1920. It is worth noting here that when Tissen talks about the Ruhr conflict and the occupation of the Ruhr, it is not about the Ruhr workers' revolt, but about the subsequent occupation of this region by French troops. However, it clearly shows the desire of industrialists and the aristocracy to restore the pre-revolutionary order. But let's move on. Tissen refused the offer of Klaas and continued, I went to see Ludendorff chiefly to pay him a call of courtesy, but also in order to discuss with him the great national questions, which then preoccupied his mind as much as mine. Then Tissen describes the political and economic situation of the country. Let's skip this. Such was the atmosphere in which my first meeting with Hitler took place. I cannot recall with certainty the exact part which each of us took in the conversation, yet I remember the general content. Ludendorff and Hitler agreed to undertake a military expedition against Saxony in order to depose the communist government of Dr. Zeigener. The ultimate aim of the proposed expedition was to overthrow the Weimar democracy, whose weakness was leading Germany into anarchy. Funds were lacking. Ludendorff accepted fees for the interviews which he gave to American newspaper correspondents. However, as he told me, this did not get him very far. He had already solicited and obtained the help of several industrialists, particularly that of Herr Minow of the Stinn firm. For my part, I gave him the about 100,000 gold marks. This was my first contribution to the National Socialist Party. Just months later, Ludendorff and Hitler, with the support of private military formations known as storm detachments, attempted a coup d'etat. Coincidence? Of course, at first, the NSDAP support was not as broad and comprehensive as it had been on the eve of Hitler's rise to power. Moreover, even on the eve of the establishment of the fascist dictatorship, some entrepreneurs did not see Hitler as their Führer. Let's get back to the Nuremberg trial, the Flick case. Frederick Flick, entrepreneur, head of the Flick concern, convicted of organizing the deportation of the population and forcing them into slavery for spoliation in the occupied territories and complicity in SS crimes. Testimony of the defendant Flick, payments and donations for political purposes, 1932. The total investment amount is 1.5 million Reichsmarks, including a. The parties of the center, i.e. the current government, Hindenburg, Brüning, Schleicher, 1,220,000 Reichmarks, right-wing parties with the exception of the NSDAP, 130,000 Reichmarks, 
left-wing parties, apparently we are talking about the Social Democratic Party of Germany, 100,000 Reichmarks, and D, the Nazis, only 50,000 Reichmarks, the least of all, which, by the way, will not prevent successful cooperation in the future. They'll even write a book about it, this one. It is clear to see that businessmen paid all, the left, the centrists, and the right. The entire political spectrum is being fed by the oligarchs. There are no incorruptible pro-business parties. Pro-business party means for sale. Politics under capitalism is just another service sector. Following the failed putsch, the Nazis attracted the attention of another major Ruhr businessman, Emil Kierdorf, who we are already familiar with. Hitler first met with Kierdorf in 1927 and immediately won his heart. Impressed by the meeting with the Führer, Kierdorf took the job to spread the Nazi program among the leading entrepreneurs of industry, banks, and commerce. I put myself entirely at the disposal of his movement, Kierdorf recalled with pride. Naturally, he did everything to ensure the party's financial prosperity. The important role of Kierdorf and Thyssen is echoed by the Nuremberg Military Tribunal. Much has been written about the early relations between Hitler and the German industrialists. Much remains to be learned. But it is clear from what has been written and from documents which will be offered that Hitler's two principal sponsors and financial supporters in heavy industry were Fritz Thyssen, the dominant figure in the German Steel Trust, and Emil Kerdorf, who has been head of the largest German coal syndicate and of the Gelsenkirchen mines. Now let's continue with other documentation. International Military Tribunal, Nazi Conspiracy and Aggression, Supplement A. Statement prepared by Walter Funk on the relationship of German industry to the party and the National Socialist leadership of the state. Walter Funk, president of the Reichsbank from 1939 to 1945 and Reich's Minister of Economics in Hitler's Germany from 1938 to 1945, sentenced to life in prison by the International Military Tribunal in 1946. In 1957, he was released for health reasons. He died three years later. In 1931, Strasser, Schatz, Reinrichsbauer, and his friends in industry, especially the leading personalities of the Association for Mining Interests in the Rhineland and Westphalia, strengthened me in my decision to enter the NSDAP in order to persuade the party to follow the course of private enterprise. At that time, the leadership of the party held completely contradictory and confused views on economic policy. I tried to accomplish my mission by personally impressing on the Fuhrer and the party as a whole, the private initiative, self-reliance of the businessmen, i.e. the creative powers of free enterprise, be recognized as the basic economic policy of the party. The Fuhrer personally stressed time and time again during talks with me and industrial leaders to whom I had introduced him that he was an enemy of the state economy and of so-called planned economy and that he considered free enterprise and competition as absolutely necessary in order to gain the highest possible production. My industrial friends and I were convinced in those days that the NSDAP would come to power in the not-too-distant future, and that this had to be if communism and civil war were to be avoided. We need to note here that the German business community took a very peculiar approach to solving the issue of the civil war, to kill all those who disagree with the sacred right of private property and unleash the Second World War. We can't declare that this was in the interests of the German nation. However, when it comes to profit, no one thinks about the entire nation. Let's move on. At that time, I learned of the existence of friendly relations between Emil Kierdorf, the leading personality of the Ruhr coal industry, and the Führer. Though Kierdorf and later through Fritz Thyssen, Führer was introduced to influential Rhinish Westphalian industrial circles who supported him and the party financially. These payments, as far as I learned, had not amounted to 1 million Reichsmarks by 1931-1932. I do not know how much was contributed previously, nor how much was given by other circles. At any rate, the amounts were trivial compared to the amounts running into the millions with which industrial circles continuously supported other parties, especially the German People's Party, German National People's Party, and Democratic Party. The Social Democrats were mainly supported by banks and concerns whose directors had personal connections with Social Democratic Party officials. Once again, we see that the entire political spectrum is being fed by businessmen. Again, we can see that pro-business politics is simply a service sector. You can buy an hour of work as a barber, or you can buy five years as a deputy, 
or four years as a president or chancellor. Funk further notes that Krupp and a number of other entrepreneurs have so far shunned the Nazis. However, definitely in favor of National Socialism were besides Kurdorf, his nephew Kauert, Tissen, Tengelmann, Springerum, Vergler, Knepper, Winkhaus, Buskerl, Kellermann. These are all big industrialists if you still don't get it. Next, Funk describes who had a more or less neutral relationship and then continues. The potassium industry under the leadership of Roster and Indeen already at that time had a positive attitude towards the Führer and the party. Baron von Schroeder had the closest relations to the party within the banking world. His senior chief Stein was a friend of Dr. Schacht. I introduced Dr. Fischer, Deutsche Credit Gesellschaft, and Reinhard, Commerzbank, to the Führer personally. Dr. von Strauss of Deutsche Bank had connections with the Führer, Göring, and Dr. Goebbels. I introduced Schmidt and Hilgard, Allianz Insurance Corporation, as well as Dr. Lubert. Enough with the names, let's move on. Why did all these people show such interest in the Nazis? Let's turn to the testimony of a representative of the financial community, Dr. Schacht. Yalmar Schacht, Walter Funk's predecessor as president of the Reichsbank from 1933 to 1939, and Reich's Minister of Economics from 1934 to 1937. Despite the protests of the Soviet Union, he was fully acquitted at the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg, which was one of the reasons for the split of the Judicial Coalition. International Military Tribunal, Volume 12, Testimony of Hallmar Schacht, in which he recounts his conversation with Hitler at Goering's house in early 1931. What he said concerned national questions, in which he agreed absolutely with us. In social questions, Hitler expressed a number of good ideas. He was especially intent on avoiding class struggle and on eliminating strikes, lockouts, and wage disputes by decisive intervention of the state and labor relations and the direction of economic affairs. There was no demand for abolishing private enterprise, but merely for influence in its conduct. It seemed to us these ideas were quite reasonable and acceptable. Aside from that, he revealed practically no knowledge in the field of economy and financial policy. He merely asked that we as representatives of economy should have understanding for his ideas and give him factual advice. That was the purpose of that evening. So the Nazis promised their investors to end the class struggle, strikes, and other conflicts between labor and capital. That was exactly what businessmen wanted. To be fair, it wasn't just the Nazis who made such promises, but they did it better than their competitors. Simply put, the NSDAP provided a ready-made package of political services, and entrepreneurs were thinking whether they wanted to buy them or not. And the more the global economic crisis called the Great Depression raged, the more the entrepreneurs turned their attention to the Nazis. Toward the end of 1931, Tissen, Kurdorf, and others arranged a series of meetings between Hitler and the leading Ruhr industrialists in order to give Hitler an opportunity to expound his views and win converts. Hitler, for his part, was just as anxious to gain for the Nazi party the political and financial support of heavy industry. For political historians, there can be nothing of more compelling interest than those early meetings between the stiff, arrogant Iron Lords and the demonic Führer to be. Hitler and the Ruhr leaders found solid common ground in mutual contempt for democracy and admiration of ruthless, authoritarian power politics. At a meeting on the 27th of January 1932 in Dusseldorf, attended by Tissen and Fergler of the Steel Trust and a large group of other Ruhr industrialists, Hitler delivered one of his shrewdest and most persuasive speeches, which, according to Tissen, made a deep impression on the assembled industrialists, and in consequence of this, a number of large contributions flowed from the resources of heavy industry. Later in 1932, a basis was laid for permanent and systematic collaboration between Flick and the Nazi leaders. Hitler had asked his personal economic advisor, Kepler, to collect a small group of economic leaders who will be at our disposal when we come into power. Kepler and Schacht approached Flick, Vergler, and others. The result was the formation of what was then called the Kepler Circle, which began to hold meetings to discuss the program of the Nazi party in the economic field. In May 1932, the Kepler Circle met with Hitler. The Führer made a short speech, and in it disclosed, among other things, as points of his program, 
abolition of trade unions and abolition of parties other than the NSDAP. No one raised any objection. These points of the Führer's program met with the fullest approval of the members of the Circle of Friends, but they expressed their apprehension that he would not be able to carry out these excellent ideas. Finally, we came to the final gathering where entrepreneurs, we can say officially, gave the go-ahead to establish an open terrorist dictatorship. On the 20th of February 1933, Goering invited about 20 leading German bankers and industrialists to his home in order to obtain financial support for the Nazis in the coming election. Hitler appeared and delivered a long speech. Among those in attendance was Gustav Krupp von Berlin, who made notes summarizing Hitler's speech. Hitler said in part, Private enterprise cannot be maintained in the age of democracy. It is conceivable only if the people have a sound idea of authority and personality. Everything positive, good, and valuable, which has been achieved in the world of economics and culture, is solely attributable to personality. When, however, the defense of this existing order, its political administration, is left to a majority, it will irretrievably go under. Thereafter, Goering addressed the meeting and again stressed the importance of the coming election. We must penetrate with our SA men into the darkest quarters of the cities. Goering then brought up the matter of financial contributions and concluded his solicitation with the comment that the sacrifices asked for surely would be so much easier for industry to bear if it realized that the election of the 5th of March will surely be the last one for the next 10 years, probably even for the next 100 years. So the businessmen were made clear that democracy will be replaced by a terrorist dictatorship. What was the reaction of German business? One other man spoke at this meeting, and that was Gustav Krupp von Berlin who expressed to Hitler the gratitude of approximately 25 industrialists present for having given us such a clear picture of the conception of his ideas. Krupp also stated, on behalf of all the industrialists, that it was high time to finally clarify the questions pertaining to domestic policies in Germany, and that only in a politically strong and independent state could economy and business develop and flourish. Krupp concluded by pledging 1 million marks or more on behalf of the rural industries. Eight days after this meeting, at which Hitler received the support of Krupp and other industrialists, the Reichstag building was set on fire, and on the same day, Hitler and his cabinet, utilizing the fire as a pretext, promulgated a decree suspending the constitutional guarantees of freedom. We have already said that all that German business was concerned about after 1918 was the elimination of all of the achievements of the workers from the November Revolution. In fact, we can say that the Weimar Republic is a 15-year-old period of a sluggish civil war, which ended with the victory of the forces of the counter-revolution. Hitler's Germany is a clear example of what would have happened to the countries of the former Russian Empire if the civil war had been won not by the Bolsheviks, but by the opposition. The opposition in Russia even had their own Hitler. The first thing that the Nazis started with after coming to power was the long-awaited defeat of the labor movement, International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg, Nazi Conspiracy and Aggression, the Consolidation of Nazi Power, Paragraph 1, The Battle Against the Working Class. The working people of Germany, like the working people of other nations, had little to gain personally by war. The working people of Germany had not forgotten in 1933 how heavy the yoke of the warlord can be. It was the working men who had joined the sailors and soldiers in the revolt of 1918 to end the First World War. The Nazis had neither forgiven nor forgotten. By the way, you still remember the Koppen Beer Hall Putsch, the Pan-German League, and Heinrich Klaas? It's all the same line. The Nazi program required that this part of the German population not only be stripped of power to resist diversion of its scanty comforts to armament, but also be wielded and whipped into new and unheard of sacrifices as part of the Nazi war preparation. Labor must be cowed, and that meant its organizations and means of cohesion and defense must be destroyed. The day after May 1, 1933, the Nazis struck. All funds of the labor unions, including pension and benefit funds, were ceased. Union leaders were sent to concentration camps. A few days later, on May 10, 1933, 
Hitler appointed Ley, leader of the German Labor Front, which succeeded to the confiscated Union funds. On May 19, 1933, this time by government decree, it was provided that trustees of labor, appointed by Hitler, should regulate the conditions of all labor contracts, replacing the former process of collective bargaining. The law itself explicitly states that the trustees of labor are obliged to take care of maintaining class peace. In fact, a trustee is a collective entrepreneur official who has taken on some of the functions of employers unions. In practice, this meant not only compulsory regulation of wages and working conditions if necessary, but also mediation in conflicts and suppression of strikes. Naturally, the trustees were never from working class backgrounds. They were either officials or former officers or entrepreneurs. By the way, do you know who was one of the signatories of this law? Well-known entrepreneur, former Kruppist, and founder of the Pan-German League, Alfred Hugenberg. Further, on January 20th, 1934, a law was issued that reflects the essence of the economic policy of fascism. The law, Work Order Act, which introduced the Führerprinzip in labor relations. From now on, all entrepreneurs became the Führers of their collective, the owners of the house, as they said at the time. In practice, this meant the absolute dictatorship of the enterprise owner. Working hours, salary issues, tariff agreements, fines, dismissals, production standards, labor protection, internal regulations, etc. From now on, all of this was determined exclusively by the power of the private owner. The enterpriser Führer should make decisions for employees and laborers in all matters concerning the enterprise. It was by such bait that the great German industrialists were induced to support the Nazi cause to their own ultimate ruin. This law contains the ideologically and organizationally much more dangerous sprout of the formation of a new privileged caste of leaders. This new caste of leaders is, in fact, plutocratic, for the question of who can become the leader of the economy is decided first and foremost by the possession of capital. This law restricts the social freedom of the German worker to such an extent that it resembles slavery. One of the next steps of the fascists against workers was a significant restriction of freedom of movement. According to an order issued in May 1934, agricultural workers were forbidden to move to cities without permission. During the next five years, several decrees were issued prohibiting the search for work outside their area of residence. At first, the ban applied to skilled metal workers, carpenters, and masons, and later they were joined by unskilled workers of the same specialties. Then these restrictions began to apply to all workers in the construction, mining, and chemical industries. And since 1939, all members of the family of workers in these industries have been chained to the ground, if we may say that. Further, in June of 1935, a temporary six-month labor service was introduced for men aged 18 to 25 years. By the middle of 1938, the situation had become such that the government decided upon a general labor conscription law. Issued in June 1938, it gave power to the president of the National Employment Office to conscript all Germans of every age and occupation, whether man or woman, schoolboy or aged, employer or worker, civil servant or businessman. The decree empowered him to draft anybody to any kind of work for a limited period of time and also to compel anybody to undergo special training. Two more measures of special significance for the labor market were introduced in 1938. The first is more significant of the thoroughness with which fascism began to shackle almost everybody to the war machine. It antedates the general law just described by a month and refers to convicts. It provides for compulsory labor for all prisoners regardless of the crime they have committed and the length of their prison term. The prisoner is paid next to nothing, while the employer has to pay the government 60% of the normal wage. The new year was only a few hours old when another decree appeared this time affecting the aged. If, according to the fascist physicians, workers were in sufficiently good health when reaching the retirement age under the old pension scheme, they were not allowed to retire, but were forced to continue working. And if they had already retired, they were forced to go back to work, otherwise their pension would be withdrawn. In March, a circular was issued, making it no longer a crime against the German race to employ Jews. All these laws were simply a godsend to the big entrepreneurs because they were finally completely spared the need to take into account the demands of the workers. 
After all, now the workers were either chained to their workplace or sent by the government for forced labor, including to a private entrepreneur. Thus, the real legal status of the German worker was reduced to that of a medieval serf. In fact, this was the restoration of pre-revolutionary Kaiser orders, but at a new level of business feudalism. The productive manpower of the German nation was in Nazi control. By these steps, the defendants won the battle to liquidate labor unions as potential opposition and were enabled to impose upon the working class the burdens of preparing for aggressive warfare. So the Nuremberg trials clearly show that fascist Germany is a joint project of entrepreneurs and politicians aimed at suppressing the labor movement. They knew what they were doing, they wanted it, they supported it, and they did it. But maybe Hitler outplayed everyone? He came to power, arrested businessmen, took away factories and became the sole owner and manufacturer. Let's get back to the military tribunal. Politics became a Nazi monopoly. The trade unions were stamped out. But, unless Jewish, the businessman and the officer lived comfortably and flourished under Hitler. Some inconveniences arose, to be sure. Industry was increasingly regimented, and venerable military traditions were shattered by the Hitler salute. But these were trifling annoyances compared to the scourges that the Third Reich laid on other men. The Third Reich dictatorship was based on this unholy trinity of Nazism, militarism, and economic imperialism. To industry, Hitler held out the prospect of a stable government, freedom from labor troubles, and a swift increase in production to support the rearmament and the re-establishment of German economic hegemony in Europe and across the seas. To the military, he promised the reconstruction of the Wehrmacht and the resurgence of German armed might. Everything suggests that modern liberal propaganda lies just a little bit about the suffering of businessmen under Hitler. They suffered in the same way that businessmen suffer today, for example in the United States. Always someone is left out of business. Always someone goes broke. Always someone pushes someone out with the help of connections, tricks, corruption, lobbying, and other charms of free enterprise. Now let's take a closer look at how entrepreneurs and politicians reshape the entire German economy to meet their fascist standards. The goal is simple to create the corporate state and strengthen the dominance of the country's largest corporations. The first thing, or almost the first, was organization of a trustee fund. To strengthen the NSDAP, Gustav Krupp von Berlin in May 1933 organized the Adolf Hitler Spende. This was a fund collected from every circle of German industry, banking and agriculture, and put at the disposal of Hitler, the Stalin, and other NSDAP organizations. 85% of industry contributed to it, and it was the greatest private source of funds for the NSDAP. A little later, in March 1933, the National Federation of German Industry, through Gustav Krupp as its chairman, submitted to Hitler a plan for the reorganization of German industry according to the Führer Prinzip, or Leadership Principle. The documents which we will offer make it clear that this plan was developed by Gustav Krupp in close collaboration with and after numerous conferences with Hitler himself. In transmitting the plan, Gustav Krupp stated, The turn of political events is in line with the wishes which I myself and the board of directors have cherished for a long time. In reorganizing the Reich Association of German Industry, I shall be guided by the idea of bringing the new organization into agreement with the political aims of the Reich government. Of course, the government approved Krupp's proposals and started developing appropriate measures. One of the first decrees of Hitler's government was the decree of July 15, 1933, on the forced cartelization of all independent enterprises. The point is that independent enterprises should fall under the influence of the country's largest concerns. Here we need to explain how it works. A cartel is an entrepreneurial organization that was created to regulate the production of its participants, a kind of planned economy in terms of a group of enterprises. The cartel sets quotas for each participant on the volume of production and sales, on the purchase of commodities, sets strict prices for products, and so on. Of course, the right to vote in the cartel corresponds to the amount of capital, or rather the productive capacity of the enterprise. Thus, the cartels are run by large corporations. 
Cartels come and go depending on market conditions and the desire or unwillingness to compete with each other. However, when the Nazis came to power, corporations were given carte blanche to suppress competitors with the help of cartels. Even if it was more profitable for an entrepreneur to be independent, he still had to join the cartel on the terms dictated by a large manufacturer. A month before the Cartelization Act in June 1933, the National Federation of German Industry and the Association of German Employers Unions were merged into one organization, the National Association of German Industry. Gustav Krupp was chosen as leader, but the most interesting thing began the following year. On February 13, 1934, this business union developed a project for the government to reorganize the economy. The essence is as follows. Number 1. Make the National Association of German Industry the leading industrial association of the country. That is, to subordinate to it all the other industrial associations, which there were very many. Number 2. Give the Reichsminister of Economics the right to approve the chairman of the association as Führer of German industry. Number 3. Provide him with the authority to reorganize subordinate industrial organizations. Number 4. Create a structure of management and control. All of this is a kind of continuation of the law on forced cartelization. Now it may not be clear, but a little further you will understand what it is all about. On the basis of this project, on February 27, 1934, the law on the preparation of the organic reconstruction of Germany's economic system was issued. What came out in the end can be called the restructuring of the economy on the vassal feudal principle. Look at the Nuremberg trial. They even drew a convenient diagram. The organization of German business will use it to explain. Based on the proposals of entrepreneurs, the German economy was reduced to the following form. At the very top was the Reich's economic chamber, which directly reported to the Minister of Economics. The chamber was divided into seven Reich groups, industry, commerce, banking, insurance, power, handicraft, and transportation. Reich groups were divided into economic groups, which in turn were divided into special subgroups. At the very bottom of this food chain were enterprises. The National Association of German Industry will become part of the industrial group and thus become a state authority as they wanted. Accordingly, Hitler appointed the Minister of Economics. The heads of the Reich groups and the head of the Economic Chamber were appointed by the Minister of Economics. The heads of the main and economic groups were appointed by the same Minister of Economics, but only on the recommendation of the head of the Reich's groups. All other appointments were the responsibility of the head of the Reich's group. All those organizations were created by force. All electability was abolished, and the leaders enjoyed unlimited power. All decisions concerning the distribution of orders, raw materials, selling prices, resolving disputes between firms, and so on and so forth came directly from them. The Führer Princip and the enterprise completely subordinated the workers to the owner. The Führer Princip in German business completely subordinated tens and hundreds of thousands of small and medium-sized enterprises to a small group of financial oligarchies. To see this, just look at who Hitler appointed as economic ministers and who was at the head of the Reichsgroups. Let's start with the economy ministers. Alfred Hugenberg, former Krupp's man and the largest media mogul. Kurt Schmidt, CEO of the world's largest insurance company, Allianz. Halmar Schacht, representative of the financial world, banker and official. Hermann Göring, well, yes, he became a businessman only under the Nazis. See the Reichswerke Hermann Göring, but he was the Reich's Minister of Economics just for a short time. Next, and pretty much up to the defeat of Germany, Walter Funk, a sidekick of businessmen who brought Hitler together with the elite of the German business world. In order not to be unfounded about the status of Mr. Funk, let's turn again to the military tribunal, Nazi conspiracy and aggression, copy of document 2828 PS. Transcript of Record of Financial Interrogations of Walter Funk What were the industries which you represented in your negotiations with the Nazi party in 1931? Represented is not the word. It would be better to say, which circle of industrial people urged me to enter the Nazi party? Especially those from the mining industry, Knepper in the coal industry, 
Kellermann, Fergler, Thangelmann, Lee Hill, Rosterg, also some businessmen from banking contingents such as Fischer, Reinhardt, from insurance companies Schmidt, Hilgard, Winterfeld, Siemens, Ponzen, Steel Trust, Duisburg, IG Farben, Kastel, Herl, Reichs Association of Industry. Clearly, the Reich Minister of Economics was entirely in the hands of entrepreneurs. Knowing this, their appointments can hardly surprise anyone. Take, for example, the Reich's group of industry. First Krupp took the helm, then Hecker, Trendleberg, Dierig, and the last one was Zangen. All five are major businessmen. Reich's insurance group, Edward Hilgard, member of the board of directors of Allianz, and so on and so forth. The decisive factor in this form of organization is the merger of the state and entrepreneurs. Businessmen began to carry out their will, embodying in one person a public official and a private capitalist. They became the fearers of enterprises with absolute power, and the richest also became the fearers of the economy, with absolute power not only in economic policy, but also over their weaker colleagues. After all, all these organizations were created by force, and they had to include all entrepreneurs, and there was no electability. In essence, all of the policies pursued by the Nazis are the state's push for capitalist economic development. Businessmen in government, this is nothing new. Under Hitler, it simply was no more hidden. The result of the economic policy is presented in this table. Reduction of joint stock companies by almost half, with an increase in the concentration of capital in the remaining enterprises. The poor get poorer, the rich get richer. Moreover, in October 1937, the so-called legal reform of joint stock companies came into force. In accordance with this reform, all joint stock companies with a capital of less than 100,000 marks were subject to liquidation and the creation of new companies was allowed only with a capital of at least 500,000 marks. Business crushes business, but business as a whole is thriving. However, while the cartel decrees and the reform of joint stock companies did away with small-scale industrialists in the first place, other government measures dealt devastating blows to artisans and merchants. At the direction of the government, tens of thousands of retail stores were closed in 1937, on the grounds that their turnover was not high enough or that the relevant branch of trade was too overloaded. The ruin of tens and hundreds of thousands of small speculators and artisans is also a typical process for capitalism. By eliminating many small competitors from the market, the largest capitalists not only absorbed their markets, but also proletarized the ruined owners, making them their wage slaves, just for a few cents. Of course, the Nazi economy is pure state capitalism, because this was the only way to prepare for war. But who ran the state capitalism? Hitler? The NSDAP? Of course not. The economy was given over to the unlimited self-government of the richest of the rich to make them even richer, because this is what fascism really is. Thus the Nazis have provided means for achieving the ultimates in the tendencies underlying the organizational efforts which preceded their entrance onto the scene. The pattern of control common to all large-scale business enterprise is here expanded so as to encompass the entire range of economic activities and to regiment and direct all parties of interest throughout the entire country. This hierarchical pattern, coupled with the concept of occupationally and functionally self-contained, all-inclusive, definitely circumscribed, and centrally directed trade in group categories which are ranged in a graduated order of the power, duties, and importance so as to include the activities of all Germany, constitutes the essence of the corporate state. In this chapter, we could not ignore another important topic that is not directly related to the corporate state, the topic of privatization. By buying up shares in numerous large industrial companies, banks, and shipping companies, the government of the Weimar Republic helped them overcome the economic crisis. Thus, the state became a co-owner of many large enterprises. Well, and how did the Nazis dispose of this property? In 1936 to 1938, the Third Reich was overwhelmed by the much-loved for many businessmen, privatization. The state sold off the following assets. 35% stake in Deutsche Bank, 70% ownership of Commerzbank, and the same for Deutsche Credit Anstalt from Leipzig. All these banks have become fully private again. Some of the Nazi privatization is also visible at the Nuremberg Trials. In 1937 and 1938, 
the Dresdner Bank was reprivatized. More than 85% of its shares, which since the crisis of 1931 and 1932 had been in the hands of various agencies of the German government, were sold to non-governmental purchasers consisting primarily of clients and associates of the bank. And here is another interesting case. In 1932, the Steel Trust sold its shares to the state for 90% of the face value, while on the stock exchange they were trading at 22%. This, by the way, was sold by the businessman Flick, who gave the largest bribes to the current government, and not by the Nazis. Now you understand why? In 1936, the company received back almost all its shares. Other heavy industry concerns such as the Krupp Joint Stock Company, or the Upper Silesian Metallurgical Plants, or the Atlaswerke Shipyard of the Sons of Hugo Stins, also moved to the position of exclusively private property. All major German steamship companies like Hamburg America Line, North German Lloyd, and the Hamburg Süd Steamship Company, which improved their business after World War I with state subsidies, received their shares back under the Hitler regime. However, despite all this entrepreneurial paradise, do not forget about two economic groupings, Coal Iron Steel Dresdner Bank and Electrical Engineering Chemistry Deutsche Bank. The fight between these groups created many conflicts and squabbles, both among the top leaders and at the bottom. This confrontation is used by so-called scientists as a shield they hide behind when they claim that there are no unified class interests of German fascism. However, none of these groups supported the working class or the pacifist course of economic development. The question of whether to beat the workers or not to beat them, to arm themselves or not to arm themselves, was not raised at all. The question of how to arm themselves was a matter of serious disagreement, since it depended on which group would profit more from armaments than the other. Chemical industry concerns put forward the concept of so-called high-quality weapons, where the basis of military power would be based on the production of synthetic gasoline and other chemical products. But this required additional large investments, which were sabotaged by supporters of the regular so-called quantitative weapons. At the same time, both groups perfectly understood that any reorganization and any orientation would not give them the results they needed if they did not take more decisive measures to further political and economic enslavement of the working class. This is exactly what the Nazis were doing. By smashing the labor movement and the communists, the chain dogs of capital cleared the way for worldwide military aggression. There can be no justification for German entrepreneurs. It would be a major mistake to say that they, although they financed Hitler, did not sympathize with the terror he was conducting. Because there was a group of leading German industrialists who considered it as their duty to finance the affairs of Himmler and his SS men, we mentioned before about the Kepler Circle, which was personally initiated by Hitler. A little later, Kepler Circle grew into the circle of friends of Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler's. Over the entire course of the Third Reich, indeed even into early 1945, the circle continued to hold its regular monthly meetings consisting of dinner and an evening's discussion. Himmler became the chief sponsor of the group. It also became the practice of the circle to make financial contributions to Himmler, aggregating over 1 million marks a year. If the members of the circle considered themselves friends of Himmler, he returned the compliment. He not only invited them to monthly or bi-weekly meetings, he personally conducted them to the innermost shrines of the Nazi faith. Each year, under Himmler's auspices, they attended the Reichsparteitag celebrations at Nuremberg. Each 9th of November, they went to Munich to attend a Nazi memorial exercise and witness the swearing-in of new SS men. We also know that Himmler took the circle on tours of the concentration camps at Dachau, Oranienburg, and elsewhere. He also frequently invited them to visit his headquarters. Members of the circle recall one such visit to his headquarters on the Eastern Front in December 1943. Himmler told them, among other things, that he was considered a cruel man by many people because of the stern measures he applied. While we of course do not know everything that was said at the many private meetings of the circle of friends, it is impossible to believe that Himmler did not give his special friends some idea of what sort of things the SS did. 
As good businessmen, they were no doubt curious to know how the money they contribute to Himmler's special funds was spent, and Himmler must have satisfied their curiosity. Himmler was not a man who went to much trouble to hide his purposes. But it was not Himmler alone, among the members of the circle, who could give Flick and Steinbrink an expert account of what the SS meant and what it did. Himmler's chief lieutenants were also members. There was Oswald Pohl. Oswald Pohl, German SS functionary during the Nazi era, as head of the SS main economic and administrative office and the head administrator of the Nazi concentration camps, he was a key figure in the final solution, the genocide of the European Jews. Convicted of crimes committed in concentration camps, mass murder and atrocities committed there, as well as for forced slavery, hanged by the decision of the American military tribunal in Nuremberg. Pohl also naturally had charge of the supply of concentration camp labor, and in this connection he has stated, Because of the acute manpower shortage, almost all armament concerns approach my office to obtain labor from concentration camps. Those who already employed such labor in most cases constantly requested that the number of prisoners working for them should be increased. If you did not know, then the basis for the production of German weapons were private enterprises. In other words, we are talking about businessmen requesting more and more slaves. The Flick case, which we are currently reading, is dedicated to one of these businessmen. Another member of the circle was Otto Ohlendorf. Otto Ohlendorf, Gruppenführer SS, commander of the Einsatzgruppe D, area of operation, Ukraine, Bessarabia, Kishinev, Crimea, Caucasus. Convicted of purposeful extermination of Jews, gypsies, and communists. His unit is responsible for the mass murder in Simferopol, where more than 14,000 people were killed on December 13, 1941, hanged by the decision of the American military tribunal in Nuremberg. Ollendorf confessed before the International Military Tribunal his participation in the murder of at least 90,000 persons, and has stated, when the German army invaded Russia, I was leader of Einsatzgruppe D in the southern sector, and in the course of the year during which I was leader of Einsatzgruppe D, it liquidated approximately 90,000 men, women, and children. The majority of those liquidated were Jews, but there were among them some communist functionaries too. The circle also was well represented in connection with the medical experiments in which many concentration camp inmates were murdered and suffered unbelievable tortures. Oswald Pohl provided the victims for these experiments. Wolfram Sievers, another member of the circle. Wolfram Sievers, one of the leaders of the racial policy of the Third Reich, SS Oberführer, General Secretary of the Annenerbe, convicted of forced medical experiments and the murder of concentration camp prisoners, hanged by the decision of the American military tribunal in Nuremberg. The nature of the research conducted by the Annenerbe appears from one sentence of a letter written by Sievers in November 1942. I have already reported to the Reich leader SS that for some anthropological studies, 150 skeletons of inmates, that is Jews, are needed and should be provided by the Auschwitz concentration camp. Of course, these members of the circle were not the only sources of detailed knowledge of SS crimes available to Flick and Steinbrink. For example, the important role of the SS in the slave labor program was well known to them. They themselves made use of the services of the SS to recruit foreign workers, especially for the coal mines of the Ruhr. No doubt the defendants will say in this case what so many defendants have said in other cases, that they knew nothing about the horrible crimes until after the war was over. Their Jewish business acquaintances disappeared, and the Jewish retail store around the corner changed hands. Yellow stars appeared on people's clothes. French and Polish workers suddenly became available as labor for their mines and factories. Numberless Germans, many of whom the defendants must have known, mysteriously disappeared. But these defendants will say they knew nothing. They did business with Goering. They met regularly with Himmler and his most rabid colleagues, but we are asked to believe that all these men must have been Dr. Jekylls. They helped Himmler through his lean years and enabled him to live and work in the manner to which he became accustomed, but presumably they knew nothing of where the money went. All this the prosecution respectfully suggests is quite incredible. In conclusion, we present a list of people who are close to Himmler, compiled by the founder of the circle, 
Wilhelm Kepler, only 42 people. This is not the whole list, but only those who Kepler was able to remember. Among them, 23 entrepreneurs, including people from such firms as Steel Trust, Flick Concern, IG Farben, Dresner and Deutsche Banks, Commerzbank, Allianz Insurance Company, Siemens and Bosch Concerns. Some of these individuals were also members of the SS. There are seven of these members of the circle who were convicted by the Nuremberg Military Tribunal, already named Paul, Ollendorf, Sievers, Flick, and Steinbrink, plus Heinrich Butefisch, a businessman from IG Farben, Honorary Obersturm Bonfuhrer SS, convicted of forced slavery, Karl Rasche, Dresner Bank, Honorary SS Obersturm Bonfuhrer, convicted of spoliation of the Czech Republic and Holland, and this man, Albert Fogler of the Steel Trust would have been court-martialed, but he killed himself in April 1945. The circle of friends of the Reichsführer SS is a perfect example of the merging of the top of the old financial capital in the newly formed Nazi hierarchy. From Deutsche and Dresdner banks to racial research and medical experiments, from Bosch to Pohl, who was responsible for the gold teeth and stolen purses of prisoners, from the advanced concerns of Flick, Siemens, and Farben, to the ultra-conservative nobility represented by a descendant of Otto von Bismarck, and to the Einsatzgruppen that executed hundreds of thousands of people. Fascism is one of the many products of capital. Tens of millions of victims, rivers of blood, destroyed cities and towns, destroyed production. This system can produce iPhones and medicines, or it can enthusiastically burn people alive or suffocate them in gas chambers. And now, after spending just an hour or so to get acquainted with the overall picture, we can continue to talk about the Krupp company with a clear conscience. From the First World War, the Krupp firm has conspired against the peace of Europe. Like the Nazi party, it has nurtured at all times the idea that Germany would rise to power through its military might. In 1933, it entered into an alliance with that party for the realization of their common objectives. Its activities, both before and after this alliance, contributed materially to Germany's ability to wage its wars of aggression. We need to remind that in the same year, Gustav Krupp was organizing the so-called Adolf Hitler Spende, or Adolf Hitler Fund. This was a fund collected annually from every circle of German industry, including banking and agriculture. The proceeds were put at the disposal of Hitler and various Nazi party organizations, including the SA, the SS, and the Hitler Youth. The support which Krupp gave the Nazi party was dictated, in part, by very practical considerations of self-interest. The development orders which the firm received from the Weimar Republic, while valuable in that they preserved the position and connections of the firm, could not possibly return Krupp's capital investments in armament production. For that, a large-scale armament production program, unhampered by the restrictions of the Versailles Treaty, was necessary. It was precisely this which the Nazis promised. By aiding their accession to power, Gustav Krupp was simply collecting on the gamble taken in 1918. In a Germany pledged to rearmament, Krupp would again flourish as the weapons forge of the Reich. The period of losses would be over. Such indeed proved to be the case. The Krupp board of directors were able to report for the business year following the Nazi seizure of power that the business for the first time after three years of losses yielded a profit. The report reads, the upward trend of German economy which marked the past year was visibly reflected in our plants. The measures of the Reich government designed to promote the national work have given a vigorous impulse to the entire industrial life of our people. A strong, new, national will to work, founded upon a national basis, has superseded the class struggle and found free expression in new legal forms. We emphasize once again that entrepreneurs know very well what class struggle is and know very well what it leads to. And of course, real entrepreneurial freedom can only be expressed in new legal forms. Fascism, like unlimited freedom of enterprise, is just such a new form. In 1935, the net profits of the firm after taxes, gifts, and reserves were approximately 57 million Reichsmarks. In 1938, they were 97 million. In 1940, 111 million. 
This increase in the profits of the Krupp firm was the direct result of the tremendous armament program launched under the Third Reich. From the time of the Nazi seizure of power until the defeat of Germany, the relations between Hitler and the Krupp firm were exceedingly close. Hitler often visited Krupp to inspect the progress of particular projects. He consulted with its members, particularly the defendants Alfred Krupp and Erich Müller, on armament problems. He participated in planning its expansion, and almost every project of any size worked on by Krupp was on Hitler's personal order. Maybe, despite everything, the entrepreneurs did not know that they were going to war? Maybe they didn't want it? The industrialists, including Krupp, were advised that the purpose of the four-year plan was to prepare Germany for war. On the 17th of December 1936, in Hitler's presence, Goering made a speech in Berlin to the Reichsgruppe industry, in which the intention of the Nazi government to wage war was plainly stated. Goering said, among other things, the battle which we are approaching demands a colossal measure of productive ability. No limit on the rearmament can be visualized. The only alternative in this case is victory or destruction. If we win, business will be sufficiently compensated. Our whole nation is at stake. We live in a time when the final battle is in sight. We are already on the threshold of mobilization, and we are already at war. All that is lacking is the actual shooting. The Nazis gave rearmament an absolute priority over the other programs. Budget expenditures on weapons were pouring in, and the world was preparing to plunge into a hitherto unseen bloodbath. And if IG Farben was responsible for preparing the industry for war in general, Krupp was the blacksmith who forged the German sword of war. All types of gun barrels, tanks, tank turrets, armor plates, self-propelled guns, carriages, howitzers, mortars, railway and anti-aircraft guns, submarine, ship armor and naval guns, a system of long-term fortifications, Siegfried Lane, Fat Gustav and thousands of other products needed for the German war machine, all the work of one private company. On the 1st of May 1940, Rudolf Hess and other prominent Nazis visited Essen to confirm on the Krupp company the Golden Banner, which distinguished the works as a National Socialist model plan. Gustav Krupp acknowledged the award with the following words, I share with the entire personnel of the Kruppwerks a pride in this award. It is in honor of a social-political attitude which, while having its roots in a 128-year-old tradition, has developed organically so as to fit into the new times, into the National Socialist Germany. These words accurately epitomize the defendants. Nothing need be added. The tradition of the Krupp firm and the social-political attitude for which it stood was exactly suited to the moral climate of the Third Reich. There was no crime such a state could commit, whether it was war, plunder, or slavery, in which these men would not participate. Long before the Nazis came to power, Krupp was a National Socialist model plan. Living space is a theory according to which the state is considered as a constantly growing living organism. Once the body becomes cramped within its borders, it supposedly naturally tends to expand them. Allegedly, all this is a natural process, which means that there can be no blame for it. But that's simply rubbish. Who gets cramped? Capital that constantly wants to grow. Who will get the mines, land, raw materials, and factories? Capital. Who trades on the vacant living space? Capital. The theory of living space is the theory of living space for capital. It either grows by itself and becomes cramped within its former borders, or its competitors grow and thus also constrain the borders. Even prior to the war, the German Reich government had invited German industrialists to submit an account of all losses of property suffered in consequence of the defeat in the First World War and the Treaty of Versailles. Krupp had suffered such losses, particularly in Lorraine, although money compensation had been paid by the German Republic. Just like in the First World War, the capitalists must set the desired goals. Based on the desires of capital, strategic military goals are also built. Property dictates to politicians where to move, because politicians have no desire to fight at a loss to the economy. 
What is equally disgusting about all of this is that even if the capitalists and the military fail to achieve their goals, the workers who survived the massacre will pay the price. That's why a nation is needed to nationalize losses, so that there are those who will pay for all military adventures. War is always a win-win lottery for capitalists. This is why the armistice, as Lenin said, is just a preparation for another massacre of peoples. Long before the German invasion of Austria, the Krupp firm had coveted, and coveted in vain, the Berndorfer Metallwarenfabrik, the most important Austrian metal enterprise. By the time the Krupp firm became interested in the acquisition of Berndorfer, 85% of the Berndorfer shares were owned by one of Austria's principal banks, the Austrian Kreditanstalt. Despite all Krupp's efforts, however, the Austrians were not willing to sell the majority interest in Berndorfer. In March 1938, the invasion of Austria and the subsequent Anschluss presented Krupp with its long-sought opportunity. Krupp, accordingly, was dependent upon the government for approval of the purchase of the Berndorfer shares, and this was accomplished through Hermann Göring, who directed that the Berndorfer enterprises could be sold only to Krupp. The Kreditanstalt lost its independent Austrian character soon after the Anschluss and bowed to force and transferred the Bendorfer shares to Krupp. Czechoslovakia is mentioned only briefly, however. The defendants knew that Germany's series of aggressions called for ever-increasing production. Increased production necessitated more machines, more raw materials, more workshops, more workers. When the Krupp leaders asked for or received increased production quotas during World War II, they in fact asked for or received Nazi titles to spoilation, loot, plunder, and slave labor, since domestic sources to carry out these production quotas were known by the defendants to be entirely inadequate. German industrialists took an intense interest in the execution of decrees, such as the one just quoted, and many of them started in advance to mark out areas, spheres of interest, or particular enterprises which they wished to take over as part of the spoils of war. The avidity of some of the industrialists was so marked that in June 1940, both Goering and Walter Funk were forced to caution important German businessmen that no excesses should occur, which might give an opening to the opponents of private enterprise. If only they knew how it would end, they wouldn't make such silly warnings. Following the German occupation, German industries, among them Krupp, put in claims to booty in France. Krupp sent groups of technical experts into the occupied zone in France and obtained reports concerning French enterprises, which Krupp might take over advantageously. Krupp unlawfully obtained control through trusteeships and so-called sponsorships of numerous French enterprises. Acquired rights and interests in mines, including the Wolfram Ore Mine Montbelot, founded jointly with other German concerns the Erzgesellschaft for the joint exploitation of French ore deposits, threatened the French custodian of Jewish property and thereby obtained the privilege of exploiting the Austin factory in Liancourt, took over the engineering corporation Elmat Plant in Alsatz, participated with other industrial concerns in the Hermann Göring works in the seizure and exploitation of Lorraine coke ovens, gas, and other property, participated in the dismantling of French factories, and was a beneficiary of the looting of French raw materials, machinery, automobiles, urban real estate, and other property, goods, and materials. In Holland, the principal feature of the German program of plunder was the actual confiscation of raw materials, semi-finished products and machinery, and the removal of such goods from Holland to Germany. The Krupp firm was well prepared to participate in these activities because of its long-standing business connections with Dutch firms and banks, as well as extensive ownership interests in Holland. In large measure, the activities described above were carried out in Holland from 1942 to 1944, through and by means of what was known as the Lager Action. This was a requisition action chiefly for the benefit of the German iron and steel industry, and in the course of it, nearly 400,000 tons of steel and iron tubes and pipes, sheet metal, and other iron and steel products were shipped to Germany. The Riksbüro sent lists of available confiscated materials to the RVE, the members of which, including Krupp, thereupon sent representatives to Holland to select the materials wanted by each firm. 
a large share of the products so seized were allocated to Krupp. The Krupp firm paid a price fixed by the German-controlled Riksbüro, which the Dutch owners had to accept without prior negotiations. During the last phase of the German occupation of Holland in 1944 and 1945, when the German industrial area of the Ruhr was undergoing heavy air attacks and was threatened by the Allied armies, the Germans inaugurated an even more ruthless program of plunder entitled the Ruhr Hilfe Action, the Ruhr Assistance Action. These confiscations of Dutch machinery and tools for removal to the Ruhr were carried out by open force and constituted plain plunder. Krupp took part in the Ruhr Hilfe action, particularly in the plundering of large Dutch factories in Hilversum, Rotterdam, Dordrecht, and Gorinchem. Finally, we come to the most unprecedented robbery in the history of mankind, the robbery of the Soviet Union by the capitalists. German plunder in the Soviet Union, in contrast to the somewhat more devious techniques utilized in the West, was conducted with complete openness and with no attempt to comply, even superficially, with the requirements of international law. It should be noted here why this was the case. The fact is that entrepreneurs in principle do not understand the word public. They view all things and relationships in the world as goods that always have an owner. The Soviet Union is a country of socialism and public property. The industry did not have any individual private owners. Therefore, in the eyes of businessmen, this property is nobody's. And if the property is nobody's, then there can be no right in relation to it. Naturally, all the businessmen of the world thought so. However, the only thing that forced them to recognize the socialist type of property was the strength of the Soviet Union. Let's continue. These unlawful policies were not kept secret, but were proclaimed from the housetops. On the 17th of July 1941, Hitler publicly stated, On principle, we have now to face the task of cutting up the giant cake according to our needs in order to be able firstly to dominate it, secondly to administer it, and thirdly to exploit it. The government of the Third Reich set up a variety of quasi-governmental agencies and monopoly organizations to carry out the program for the exploitation of the Soviet economy. One of these agencies, the Bergen Huttenwerke Gesellschaft Ost, commonly known as the BHO, was entrusted with the task of managing, in the interests of the German war economy, the Russian coal and iron industry, as well as the mining of iron ore. And it was through the BHO that the Krupp firm effected some of its more important spoliation acquisitions in the Soviet Union. In August 1942, a meeting was held in the office of the defendant Löser for the purpose of discussing the administration by Krupp of important factories in the Ukraine, which had been allocated by the Reich to the Krupp firm. The defendant Korshan was empowered to establish policies in these Ukrainian plants, supervise distribution of raw materials, and decide financial matters. A few weeks later, in September 1942, at a meeting attended by the defendants Alfred Krupp, Lerzer, Fiersch, and Eberhardt, there was further discussion of plans for the production of munitions in the Ukrainian factories. It was decided that Krupp would form a new corporation to which the Reich would transfer the Ukrainian plants for the purposes of operation and management. It's also saying that among the plants transferred to the Krupp company were the plants in Mariupol, and on other pages of the case are mentioned plants Ilyich and Azov A in Kramatorskaya, the Molotov works in Dnipropetrovsk, electro steel plant in Mariupol. Krupp also participated in programs for the mining operations and metallurgical enterprises in the company, most likely they are talking about the Donbas, as well as the seizure of raw materials, iron scrap, and other property. As the German armies were driven back across Soviet territory, some of the seized Soviet factories were destroyed as part of a ruthless program of devastation, and others were systematically looted. An example of the latter type of industrial pillage is contained in a letter of the 20th of September 1943 from the defendant Erich Müller. Let's describe that in short. This letter says that several rail wagons with equipment seized from Ukrainian factories arrived at Auschwitz. Further, Free entrepreneurs discussed how to transport equipment to Germany and how not to lose it on the way. You never know who will steal in such a rush. Yugoslavia and Greece also did not escape such a faith, but there are enough examples. 
on the conscience of Krupp entrepreneurs were much more serious crimes. Modern liberal propaganda tends to portray crimes of fascist Germany in the most favorable light for entrepreneurs. They say that all this is just the work of the demonic Führer, at best maybe the SS, well, or the Gestapo, and entrepreneurs are just innocent victims of circumstances. Well, they use slave labor, but it wasn't the entrepreneurs who kept the concentration camps. No, this is the work of the SS. Did the entrepreneurs torture prisoners? Come on. These are all evil Nazis. The businessmen themselves were generally against it, but they were all forced to. The soul of a private owner during the war is, of course, Oskar Schindler, the savior of the Jews. The noble entrepreneur just wanted to make money, and then realizing all the horrors created by the Nazis, relented and began to help. He spent his entire fortune on it. In order to achieve the effect from the viewer, pro-entrepreneur propaganda leads the society away from two circumstances. Number one, Schindler made his fortune from slave labor, and no matter how many Jews he saved, he saved them with their own money. All his humanism is at someone else's expense. Number two, Schindler, a slave owner who escaped punishment, saving someone's life does not remove criminal responsibility for crimes against humanity. However, he is still not considered a criminal. I've got some 200 meter horses back in Amalia. I have 20 meters at home in my garden. <laughs> we can reach the cars at the end. What? What? throw up. However, the most important social function of such stories is to separate the Nazis and entrepreneurs. They say that maniacs and criminals were only the military, and businessmen were not involved in business at all. They say that there were no private concentration camps, labor extermination, requests for the supply of slaves, beating people to death with private factory guards, and so on and so forth. Well, for real, who ever heard about dozens of private concentration camps? And yet, they existed. The Krupp case. Camps established and used by the firm of Krupp. More than 50 of them in total. No, no, no. There were no insurmountable barrier between the entrepreneurs and the SS. In fact, Krupp surpassed all other entrepreneurs in the use of slave labor, including the IG Farben chemical concern. There was no other place where sadism, senseless brutality and treatment of people as a commodity, was so brutal as it was here. An important section of German war production was that which these defendants primed with thousands of slave workers, prisoners of war, concentration camp inmates, Italian military internees, and foreign civilians from occupied lands. In respect to concentration camp inmates, the SS practice until 1942 was one of extermination by relatively quick means. At that time, a decision was made to exploit also the labor resources of these victims, and in such a way as to get a lifetime of work out of a man in a few short months. This was a policy combining work and the extermination through work. The progressive draining of Germany's manpower resources caused labor to become the main bottleneck in production, and manpower became the key to the problem. The defendants Alfred Krupp, Lerzer, Hudremont, Inn, and von Berlau, through the RVK, the RVE, and other industrial associations, addressed themselves vigorously to its solution. These associations brought the combined pressure of the industries concerned to bear on all the agencies involved in the recruitment and allocation of slave labor. The representatives of the RVK and the RVE joined with representatives of the Wehrmacht and the SS in the forcible procurement of workers. Armed guards, barbed wire enclosures, and other measures were utilized to keep workers from association with the German population and from escaping, and the few who did escape were reported to and dealt with by Krupp's plant police and the Gestapo. When hordes of starving, ragged prisoners of war and foreign workers were crammed into Essen in 1942, the defendants Ehn and the personnel department of the Gestalfabrik issued a circular reminding German civilians that all prisoners of war, even the French ones, are nationals of enemy states. 
civilian Russian workers are to be treated the same as prisoners of war. Any kind of sympathy is false sympathy, which the courts will not recognize as an excuse. The usual Krupp camps for foreign workers and prisoners of war were in many respects prisons, but Krupp also maintained jointly with the SS or Gestapo actual concentration camps in Essen and at several of its plants. Private concentration camps, have you heard of this before? Penalties, torture, and abuse, including cruel beatings, were often inflicted by persons under the supervision and control of the defendants, and sometimes by means of special torture equipment ordered and manufactured by Krupp for that purpose, and Krupp authorized its plant police to mete out punishments. Various crimes of violence committed by Krupp employees against the persons of foreign workers, prisoners of war, and concentration camp inmates took place at Essen including murders, shootings, and brutal beatings. The defendant von Bülow encouraged brutality by the expression of approval by a recommendation that a guard be publicly commended for killing a Russian prisoner of war for attempting to pick up bread while clearing rubble of the Krupp bakery in Essen. Krupp sent unruly foreign workers to a special disciplinary camp, and through the defendant von Bülow's deputy, Krupp actively encouraged harsh treatment of foreigners there so that conditions in the camp should not compare favorably with conditions in Krupp plants. In one camp, eastern women workers were awakened by pouring cold water on them. Kickings and beatings by foremen were common. Krupp officials distributed steel switches for disciplinary purposes. A fantastic method of torture employed at Krupp, Essen, was the use of an iron cupboard into which slave workers were crammed in a crouching position and left for periods of hours up to several days. A refinement of torture was to pour water during winter weather onto the victims through air holes in top of the cupboard. Persecution on political, racial, and religious grounds was practiced on workers brought from occupied countries, and especially on concentration camp inmates, eastern workers, and Russian prisoners of war. Circulars of the Krupp Gustalfabrik gave instructions that more severe punishments for the same offenses be inflicted upon Polish, Czechoslovakian, and Eastern workers than on others. For a period of years, smaller amounts of food were issued for the same work to Poles than to German workers, and the same policy was instituted in the case of other Eastern workers. The systematic discrimination against the Russian prisoners of war and the Jewish concentration camp inmates in the distribution of food at the Krupp Bertha works resulted in actual fighting between these two groups for spoiled food, which the foreign civilian workers had rejected as unfit for human consumption. The labor of foreign women and children was exploited in war production and at other tasks. When the SS sent to Essen 520 Hungarian Jewish women and girls, some of them only 14 years old, the defendants established the labor commando crew, Essen of the Buchenwald concentration camp. The defendants treated them abominably while they were under their care, and they forced them to do hard labor, including carrying great loads of stone up to three stories. As the Allied armies approached and they needed their labor no longer, several of the defendants, including Janssen, Lehmann, and Hudremont, discussed a report that these women were to be slaughtered by the SS. They decided to abandon the women to the SS and followed the defendant Hudremont's instructions to get them out of Essen. The Krupp firm did not want the Allied forces to find mutilated young women in Essen, but the Krupp leadership would even more like to hide the existence of a private concentration camp for infants. Children were separated from parents as part of the policy to require the parents to labor and for other purposes, and many children of foreign workers died of neglect and ill treatment by Krupp officials, doctors, and nurses. In a four-month period at the end of 1943 and early 1944, in a group of approximately 130 children at a camp maintained by Krupp near Essen for the children of foreign workers, approximately one-third of the children died. About one-half of the deaths were due to causes denominated on the death certificates as general weakness. Here, for example, is an excerpt from the list of the dead. Apparently, some women were taken out of the occupied territories already pregnant. In slavery, they gave birth. Then their children were taken away from them and sent to the Krupp infant camp. From the testimony of witness Ernst Wirtz. How old were these children? From babies up to the age of two years. Were these the children of Eastern workers? Yes, they had been born in the camp. How were these babies housed in the Verda camp when you saw them? 
in sort of prison bunks. They had palaces with rubber sheets and the children were there quite naked. Could you see definite signs of undernourishment in these children's? Yes, many of them had swollen heads. But let's not concentrate our attention on this camp for too long. Let's continue. The denial of food was a customary form of punishment utilized by the defendants, and severe and brutal punishment was inflicted upon starving victims who tried desperately to obtain adequate food. The defendant Lerzer ordered food withheld from foreign civilians who might be regarded as loafing on the job. The defendant von Brulau openly authorized the administration by Krupp personnel of severe corporal punishment to foreign workers caught stealing food. Food, sanitary measures, medical assistance, clothing, and shelter were customarily inadequate, and as a result, many of the workers became ill and died. After describing the horrible living conditions, barely sufficient food, the lack of medicine, bandages, and proper medical treatment in one of the prisoner of war camps in Essen, a Krupp doctor found it astonishing that the number of sick was not higher than it in fact was, 9-10% of the inmates. Krupp doctors had severe standards for release from work, and persons able to march to work were not ordinarily regarded as sick. The Krupp hospital in Essen, in reporting the causes of death in a group of 54 Eastern workers, referred to four deaths by external causes and 50 as a result of illnesses, among which were 38 cases of tuberculosis and two of malnutrition. Krupp engaged in a policy and a widespread practice of exploitation of concentration camp labor. These concentration camp inmates were employed, among other places, at the Gustalfabrik in Essen, as well as at a number of other enterprises including those in Poland, France, and the infamous Auschwitz concentration camp. Numerous other important Krupp projects were planned upon the assumption and the intention that the labor of concentration camp inmates would be available for the execution of those projects. The extent of the slave labor program in Krupp's own plants can be measured only approximately. Complete central records have not been found. Records at Essen, however, reveal that on one date, about 75,000 slave workers were being utilized in Germany by Krupp. Other records and testimony which the prosecution will present bring the total to about 100,000 persons exploited as slaves by Krupp in Germany, in countries alien to them and in concentration camps. When it is considered that records are missing and that there was a rapid turnover from deaths, escapes, abandonment of old and establishment of new plants, the total number of Krupp slave workers must have been far greater. The vast number of foreign workers exploited in their own countries and placed under restrictions frequently bordering upon slavery are not included in these figures. All of the defendants made their headquarters at Essen and could and did see from day to day the slave workers there. All or nearly all of them visited other Krupp plants employing slave labor. All of the Vorstand members and deputy members participated in procuring, exploiting, and mistreating slave labor. They took the initiative in making requests and demands for more and more slave workers. Sometimes they specified particular categories of foreign labor which they wanted, and they always knew after 1942 that their requisitions would be filled with foreign civilians or prisoners of war. No private individual firm in Germany was forced to accept female concentration camp inmates, but Krupp took them willingly. These defendants organized in detail the exploitation of all categories of slave labor. As you can see, there are no strict borders between German entrepreneurs and the Nazis. Schindler, the Jewish savior, is a mediocre exception, a drop in the bucket of criminal enterprise. Hundreds of thousands of people were exploited in private enterprises, tens of thousands were tortured to death there, and the factory's private security service was no different from the SS maniacs. Among the companies that used slave labor were such well-known giants as Dresdner Bank, Deutsche Bank, Allianz Insurance Company, Thyssen, Krupp, Flick Concern, Porsche, BMW, Mercedes, Messerschmitt, Junkers, Degussa, Siemens, Bosch, Bayer, EASF, Agfa, Horst, Henkel, and even American Ford and General Motors represented by their German branches. And if you believe the views of the author of this book, then by 1944 in Germany, there was hardly anywhere to find a large-scale production that did not use slaves in one form or another.
It is impossible to avoid and reject such an important issue as coercion to commit crimes. Part of the pro-business propaganda went on the path of recognition of the committed atrocities. On the one hand, they say, yes, there was such a thing, it's terrible. But if entrepreneurs refused to fulfill the production program of the Reich, they would be deprived of their property and rotted in concentration camps. They were forced to build tanks and planes and use slave labor, as their lives and health were at risk. Therefore, they are innocent. They are all bad Nazis, Gestapo, SS, and personally Hitler. The same approach was taken by the defendant lawyers. Let's just say in the case of Krupp, this position was completely broken. In other cases, everything is a little less obvious, but the guilt is also proven. In any case, the court found that the Krupp men acted voluntarily. Their will and desires coincided with the interests of the government. But let's take a patient approach. First of all, the prosecution emphasizes that if the defendant's crimes are established, then they can no longer be rejected by a simple, I was forced. The presumption of innocence no longer works. The crime has already been established, which means that the burden of proof to the contrary lies on the side of the defendants. The defense appealed to the existence of a tyrannical and repressive regime of the Third Reich as the basis for the application of the law on actions in a state of emergency. However, the competent and credible evidence leaves no doubt that in committing the acts here charged as crimes, the guilty individuals were not acting under compulsion or coercion exerted by the Reich authorities within the meaning of the law of necessity. The alleged compulsion relied upon is said to have been exclusively due to the certainty of loss or injury at the hands of an individual or individuals if their orders were not obeyed. In such cases, if, in the execution of the illegal act, the will of the accused be not thereby overpowered, but instead coincides with the will of those from who the alleged compulsion emanates, there is no necessity justifying the illegal conduct. This is the case. In the present case, the evidence leaves no doubt that just the contrary was true. For instance, we have Hurain above refer to a letter from the board of directors of Freed, Krupp A.G. Essen dated the 26th of September 1942, addressed to the Army High Command, which, as noted, concludes as follows. As we are, under the circumstances described, very anxious to employ Russian prisoners of war in the very near future, we should be grateful if you would give us your opinion on this matter as soon as possible. A number of other examples follow. It is especially interesting how the Krupp leadership sought to get as many military orders as possible, knowing in advance that it would be impossible to fulfill them without using slave labor. The officials of the Krupp firm well knew that any expansion of its facilities and activities would require the employment of forced labor brought from occupied territories, prisoners of war, and concentration camp inmates. There is another interesting explanation from the prosecution. It was noted that even if it were assumed that the entrepreneurs acted under duress, only crimes that would be commensurate with the potential punishment for the accused themselves could be justified. In short, if you were forced to use slaves, beat them, and kill them, then you must prove that you were threatened with the same thing. Only in this case, you may claim to be justified. When speaking not only about the Krupp company, but also about entrepreneurs in general, the Reich Minister of Armaments and Ammunition, Albert Speer, was asked, What if the industrialists refuse to comply with the government's instructions? The answer was, The industrialist would have lost his plant. He would have lost every possibility of exerting any influence on his plant. Such cases did occur, but not because of a refusal by the industrialist, but merely brought about by the fact that a plant regularly failed to achieve the production required of it. As an example, I might mention the replacement of the plant manager of Krupp Markstedt, whose position was filled against Krupp's wishes by a Hamburg plant manager. So, if they refused to comply with the government's instructions, entrepreneurs were threatened with property confiscation. However, the threat of deprivation of property does not give the right to rob, enslave, starve, torture, maim, and kill people. Moreover, Krupp is a family business. It has long been owned by only one person. In this situation, this person was the son of Gustav Krupp, Alfred Krupp, and the board of directors is generally hired staff. This means that most of the accused risk losing their jobs. Can you imagine? 
They were allegedly forced to consistently help the Nazis in everything and personally commit crimes because you could have lost your warm seat on the board of directors. What a tragedy to think of it. But pro-business propaganda appeals to this. Please understand that it's not their fault. They were forced to kill. Otherwise, they could be fired or lose their property. But it is worth drawing a line so there will be no sense of complete impunity for entrepreneurs under Hitler. For example, for defeatism during the war, they could really be sent to a concentration camp and even executed, regardless of whether you are an official, a worker, or an entrepreneur. But we don't talk about such things because they are taken for granted in wartime and for any side of the conflict. We are talking about what would happen to businessmen if they refused to perform their business functions in the interests of the government, and only. And as you can see, nothing critical. In addition to Speer's testimony, Krupp's colleague Friedrich Flick was questioned. The prosecutor cross-examined him, but Flick could not name a single German entrepreneur who would have been put in a concentration camp for failing to meet any quota set by the government. In continuation of talks about the threat of being sent to a concentration camp, the prosecutor says, Considering Gustav Krupp's influence and friendship with Hitler, and the influence in Germany of the firm in general, it is difficult to conceive of this possibility. The firm Krupp was not only a vital factor in the war effort, but the head of it. Gustav Krupp was a personal friend of Hitler. Gustav Krupp not only had contributed large sums of money to the Nazi party in the campaign which resulted in their rise to power, but played a leading part in bringing to Hitler's support other influential industrialists. Throughout the war years, he and the Krupp firm continued to be regarded by Hitler with high favor. Moreover, there were cases when the defendants directly violated the instructions of the government but did not get any punishment. Three examples are given. They refused to terminate the pregnancy of workers from the East in violation of a direct Gestapo decree. Then during the war, they refused to reduce the production of peacetime products. And third, here we will dive deeper into the details. The third instance relates to the sale of Reich bonds by the Krupp firm. It was related by Schroeder, head of Krupp's accounting department and a witness for the defense. From his testimony, it appears that in 1943, the Krupp officials became convinced that the war was lost and it was necessary to adopt a new policy looking to the post-war period. At that time, the firm had accumulated government bonds in the amount of 200 million Reichsmarks. Schroeder said that, We started to sell these gradually so that when the war was nearly over, we had only 68 million Reichsmarks in bonds. We did not on purpose sell all of them, because that would have been too noticeable, and it would have smelled too much of defeatism. Therefore, we had to retain a certain amount of bonds. The witness further testified that this was very dangerous, and hence was done with great secrecy. Whatever the reason, the sale of these bonds amounted to treason under the laws of the Reich for which the penalty was death. It was the very type of thing which the dreaded Gestapo, of which so much is said in this case, was supposed to detect and prevent. It is true that the sale of the bonds was not openly made, but if it conceded that in the case of individuals so influential and important as the owners and officials of the Krupp firm that the risk was great, it must also be conceded that it was readily incurred whenever they thought there was an involved interest of sufficient importance to justify such a course. Let's sum up. Upon the facts herein found, we conclude beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendants Krupp, Lerzer, Hudremont, Müller, Janssen, Ehm, Eberhardt, Hornschan, Von Brühlau, Lehmann, and Kupke are guilty on count three of the indictment. The leaders of the Krupp private firm were officially found guilty by the Nuremberg Tribunal of a crime against humanity by participating in murder, extermination, enslavement, imprisonment, and torture. Gustav Krupp is the only German entrepreneur on the list of major war criminals, but during the hearing of his case at the International Military Tribunal, it turned out that the accused could not stand trial. The medical board declared him insane. Later, Gustav's son, Alfred Krupp, will appear before the American Military Tribunal. In total, there will be 12 court cases called the subsequent Nuremberg trial. Krupp's case was the 10th. Alfred Krupp was sentenced to 12 years in prison with confiscation of personal and real estate property. 
Other defendants were sentenced to various terms of imprisonment, on average nine years. One defendant was acquitted. All these sentences, of course, are very modest given the severity of the crimes. However, the American investigative authorities have done their work quite well. There are probably no complaints about them. In general, pro-business justice is not distorting the facts, but falsifying the public importance of such crimes. That's where the trouble lies. The subsequent Nuremberg trial is first and foremost a capitalist process. From judges and politicians, to lawyers and journalists, everyone stood up for capitalism. They cannot think, feel, or act otherwise than capitalistically. Businessmen are judged by the business for the business. It's like a slave owner judging the slave owner for slavery. This is almost a crime in itself. It is simply impossible to expect objectivity in such conditions. For example, the presiding judge, in other words, the head of the judicial process, openly opposed the confiscation of property and specifically emphasized this in the form of a dissenting opinion. Apparently, his logic was this. Everything that was acquired under Hitler before the war was acquired legally, i.e. the fascist economy, the deprivation of workers of their labor rights, the vassal feudal system of subordination, was absolutely legal. You can't touch this. Regardless of how and for what this property was used later, regardless of the fact that this supposedly legitimate property has become a kind of instrument of crime against tens of thousands of slaves and thousands were tortured to death. You can't confiscate it. It's an infringement on the sacred right to private property. Generally speaking, the situation was extremely inconvenient for the Allies. They needed to gain a foothold in the occupied part of Germany in order to form an anti-communist front, the Cold War. If you run the flywheel of justice to the full extent, in the end, the largest German concerns will remain without owners. One way or another, this would lead to destabilization in the rear. It was necessary to come up with something, and in the end they came up with it. Grant amnesty to criminals and return all confiscated property to them. This was the only way to form an anti-communist front. On May 23, 1949, the Federal Republic of Germany was proclaimed. The United States, Great Britain, and France liquidated their military administration. Henceforth, the winning countries were to be represented by their high commissioners. So the high commissioner from the Americans was John McCloy. On January 31, 1951, the high commissioner decided to grant amnesty to war criminals, including all convicted and all subsequent Nuremberg trial entrepreneurs. At the same time, all the property confiscated from Alfred Krupp was returned. Because, as stated by McCloy, the confiscation of personal property is incompatible with the American concept of justice. In just a little while, McCloy will take a seat as chairman of the board of directors of Chase Manhattan Bank, today known as part of the financial holding company J.P. Morgan Chase. A coincidence? After being released from prison, Alfred Krupp remained a billionaire. He immediately began to restore the firm's former position. It is clear that there was no complete freedom of action. That's impossible. But the fact remains that Krupp still exists today. By the end of the 20th century, it merged with the Thyssen Company, which also successfully survived all the hardships and adversities of the post-war years. They are doing well. Fascism won. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Enjoy it. What? This. Tell me I'm everything you despise. That I'm the personification of evil. That I'm what? Responsible for the breakdown of the fabric of society and world order. I'm a one-man genocide. <laughs> say everything you want to say to me now. Because you don't have long. Are you paying attention? Or are you delusional? 
You have broken every arms embargo written. There is enough evidence here to put you away for consecutive life sentences. You are going to spend the next 10 years of your life going from a cell to a courtroom before you even start serving your time. I don't think you fully appreciate the seriousness of your situation. Trust me, I fully appreciate the seriousness of my situation. But I promise you, I won't spend a single second in a courtroom. You are delusional. I like you, Jack. Well, maybe not, but I understand you. Let me tell you what's going to happen. And this way you can prepare yourself. Okay. Soon there's going to be a knock on that door and you will be called outside. In the hall, there will be a man who outranks you. First, he'll compliment you on the fine job you've done, that you're making the world a safer place, that you're to receive a commendation and a promotion. And then he's going to tell you that I am to be released. You're going to protest. You'll probably threaten to resign. But in the end, I will be released. The reason I'll be released is the same reason you think I'll be convicted. I do rub shoulders with some of the most vile, sadistic men calling themselves leaders today. But some of those men are the enemies of your enemies. And while the biggest arms dealer in the world is your boss, the President of the United States, who ships more merchandise in a day than I do in a year, sometimes it's embarrassing to have his fingerprints on the guns. Sometimes he needs a freelancer like me to supply forces he can't be seen supplying. So, you call me evil, but unfortunately for you, I'm a necessary evil. 